and uh, live, Joel Peterson. I would say, Joel, that uh, this is the the more the, the the best moment to come out with the book about entrepreneurial <laughs> maybe it's the best moment in the history of human beings it's the moment not the best moment because it's a good moment but the best moment because it, people really need great leadership in this moment companies really need great leadership and people need to be entrepreneurial so entrepreneurial leadership is like uh, exactly the perfect timing for your for your new book well, I've been told it's the worst possible time to put out a yeah. new book, but I actually do think that the subject matter is what people really need. We don't need presiders going forward. We're going to need people who can do more than manage, administrate, preside, be politicians. We really are going to need people who are entrepreneurial leaders who can reimagine business, their enterprises, their covenant with customers, et cetera. So I think you're right. I just don't know if the market will recognize it for a while. I mean, yeah, the problem is that bookstores, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to come out with the book and the bookstores are closed. But, you know, this is uh, something that uh, I, I think happen all the time. I mean, I, I wrote a couple of books and uh, every time was some kind of problem. Obviously, it wasn't a global pandemic, which is a bit different. But uh, I mean, you know, you, the the book, if it if it works, it it, it, it will just find its way. I, I'm sure about it. What's the situation, Joel, in uh, in US in this moment? Well, uh, it's opening up. The US is opening up virtually everywhere. Slower in some places than in others. So I think where we've really been hit hard is on the eastern seaboard, and uh, I think 50% of the deaths are in three states, and 30 or 40% of those are within nursing homes. So I think we're getting smarter. I think the original policy implications were really uh, rather crude. It was rather a blunt instrument we applied just to lock everything down. I think we've learned more about how the virus works. And so I think we're going to be more careful and, and be able to open things up. So it's happening like it's happening in lots of places. Got it. But on the other side, I see companies that uh, have been hit really hard. I saw, I mean, Airbnb, 50% uh, revenue lost. 25% uh, of employees just uh, fired, basically, and, and and so on. I mean, I saw Zoom, that the valuation of Zoom was the other day, the valuation of uh, air companies, all air companies combined, which, which was unbelievable, impossible to believe two yeah. months ago. So what, what do you think about all of this uh, economic situation and uh, the, this big hit on companies? Well, it's very disruptive. I mean, you mentioned down 50%. I'm in the airline business and it's down 90 to 95%. So, you know, you can't survive. You're in a capital intensive business. Uh, there's no way to survive. Of course, the US government has stepped in and made loans available and payment, payment protection plans. So we're, we don't have to furlough it, all of our employees, but it's a bridge and it's a bridge to the other side. And it's not clear what the other side is going to be or look like. So it's temporary, and I think there are some industries that are devastated. The hotel industry, uh, cruise ships, uh, the airlines, uh, bookstores, restaurants, etc. There are others, like you mentioned, Zoom, that are actually thriving. We're in a, in a business that, uh, that does uh, delivery of uh, goods, on, uh, online goods, uh, packaging these things, and, and it's doing quite well. I saw in the airline business, Richard Branson here in UK, of course, Sir Richard is very well, uh, well known and sure. respected, but I think they're asking for 500 to 600 million, uh, like government support. Otherwise they, they can't, can't keep going with, uh, with, uh, Virgin, uh, all the Virgin universe is not only the airline to be, to be fair. What, what do you think will happen to the airlines also because the low cost? The, all the low cost movement started because it was cheap to fly and you can pack tons of people inside a very uncomfortable uh, flight and uh, and that was the low cost movement but if you can't pack people inside a flight and you have to keep distance uh, so the, the the price will go up so it, it won't be possible to travel like we were traveling before. I don't know. What, what do you think will be the consequence? Well, I think there'll have to be a lot of adjustments. I mean, I think, so at JetBlue, for example, we have everybody wearing masks. We're not selling the middle seat. We're taking temperatures of people coming on the flights. We're sanitizing the planes between flights. Uh, and then we're emphasizing the fact that the air 
within the airplane is probably the cleanest air on the planet. With these HIPAA mm. filters, you know, I don't think people really realize that. So, but That's people are going to have to get comfortable again with the notion that it is safe to fly. It's always been the safest way to travel and really the most energy efficient when you think of delivering that many people to a place. It's really been quite energy efficient per passenger. So, but people are going to have to re up for this value proposition. They're gonna have to get comfortable that safety is is really preeminent in the in travel industry. Got it. What, what, what do you think are the best lessons from your entrepreneurial leadership uh, book that can be applied in this moment um, uh, that, that is really critical? I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, a small entrepreneur. I run startups for 20 years and uh, i mean, this moment, yeah, was interesting for some business, was very bad for other businesses. So uh, it, it's, it's hard, you know, it's like a, uh, my feeling was like going on the ring, uh, fighting Mike Tyson yeah. and, uh, and he punched me and I don't realize in, in which universe I am, you know, yeah. and then I have to get up and find some kind of solution. So what do you think are good lessons here to, to take away. Well, I think there are a couple of them. One is the, the power of being prepared, but you, you really can't prepare for a pandemic. I mean, you could not have enough liquidity on your balance sheet. Um, you know, shareholders wouldn't allow you to build up enough liquidity to survive this kind of a thing. But I think there are notions about preparedness. But to me, job one is survival. You know, you get in a situation like this and you have to figure out how to survive. Survival is derivative of having cash. And what that means is you've got to cut back on capital expenditures. You have to reduce operating expenses. Uh, you have to do everything you can. You get rid of hobbies and really pare down to what your core business. But that only goes so far. I think the next thing you have to do is re-examine your covenant with your customers. You know, what is your promise with customers? You may need to reimagine your business. You may need to actually think, what are we providing people and what, what do we need to change? So I think it's going to force an evolution. And that's really where being, being an entrepreneur uh, comes to the fore. I mean, you really have to think the way an entrepreneur thinks because people may not be wanting the same thing that you were able to provide before. So I think that's it. And then I, I think you have to radiate a bunch of mindsets that entrepreneurs mm -hmm. have. You confront reality. You remain optimistic. You're action oriented. You make timely decisions. Uh, there's no recrimination. Uh, and you move forward and you communicate. Uh, what I call communicate lavishly. You let people know what's going on, what, what, you mean, what you're thinking, bad news as well as good news. And that's that's all you can do. You see, that this is probably, Joel, you, you, you spotlight one of my weak point, I think, as a leader in this moment. I, I didn't communicate as much with my team as I should. Because, you know, in some moment you are busy on a million things and you try to, you know, get clients or clients start to stop paying, you know, and all these things. But this, uh, yeah, how do you say communicate Lav lavishly? Lavishly. And what I mean by that is bring people inside the tent. Let them know bad news as well as good news. And just keep them inside. They will be your partners. If you're, if you're trustworthy, if they really can trust you, they can predict and they can take decisions on their own. You're a team. Uh, the way I describe it is, is like you're belayed on a cliff. You're holding the ropes for each other. And there has to be that level of trust because this you're in a danger, mo dangerous moment. Yeah. And so you point. have to communicate. <clears throat> That's a good point. Uh, question from Twitch. Twitch, by the way, uh, that was a crazy uh, business model. I remember when Justin Khan was the founder of Twitch, he started, he came to an event, I was there, and I asked him, what do you think is, is the next move for you? And he said, look, I'm going to launch this Twitch. I will uh, show people playing video game and yeah. this will be a good hit, you know? And I said, Justin, this will be a terrible idea. I mean, who will ever watch people <laughs> playing video games? Uh, and he sold for 1 billion to Amazon. So oh. I was wrong. But now, so Twitch, for instance, they, they reinvented completely the live streaming environment. So it's an example of what we are talking about. So a uh, gross stain on Twitch is asking, Which are the emerging markets, according to you, in this new post-COVID uh, scenario? Well, I think, uh, I think shopping is going to be uh, changed a great deal. And I think the way that uh, people get groceries, get all kinds of things is going to be changed. That was already happening, but I think the evolution is going to be uh, more rapid. I think education is going to be impacted 
by mm -hmm. it. I, having taught now for a month, or well, actually two months on Zoom, I'm wow. amazed at how effective it is, but I'm also amazed at how much less effective it is than actually being with students. So I think we're gonna figure out ways to do some of both, some of what we've learned in this period, and then we're all eager to get back with one another. We're all eager to travel again if we can feel that it's safe. Uh, so my sense is there's a pent up demand in a lot of these industries that have been hardest hit, but they're gonna have to adjust. They're gonna have to think about new delivery systems that really respond to what customer concerns are. Uh, so some industries are going to take off, others are going to are going to be harmed. Do you think university, I, I've been speaking with all the top um, uh, CEOs of, of, of Italian universities that they were obviously hit very hard by COVID to try to understand their strategies, what they were thinking of doing. And uh, from what I understand, they are ready to operate in an e-learning mode for at least one year. But there are a lot of problems there. I'm curious about your opinion as a, as a professor, as a teacher. Uh, it's different to, to teach person to person or online, basically, because in video, you need a different level of engagement. You need different skills. And you have some great teachers that they are not good in communicating. They are very good. They're very knowledgeable, but they don't really know how to deal you know, with this video, audio, comments, yeah. But, but then the level of attention decreased. So how, uh, what do you see in this uh, new environment? Well, there are gonna have to be a lot of adjustments made. People are gonna have to get more tech savvy. They're gonna have to learn how to use these whiteboards and slide view and make it more seamless. Uh, what I've done in my classes, I have lunches, video lunches with small groups of students in between oh. class sessions because I teach by the Socratic method. We do a lot of role playing and cases, and it's really hard with a bunch of postage stamp faces on a screen to talk, you know, to have the energy. Uh, I, I was speaking with a colleague at Harvard who said that he's basically said he takes his lesson plan and cuts it by a third. And he says, right. that way I'm happier because I can get through that. You just have to realize you're gonna get through less material. You're gonna be less connected to students and you're going to have to do more things outside of class in order to make these connections. So it'll evolve. It won't be as good, but it'll evolve. <laughs> that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, so, Joel, one question about uh, launching a new startup today. Because everyone say, oh, no worries. The best companies started during recession, which is, I mean, it's great to know. But when you are in the middle of a recession, it's not fantastic. So... Uh, but on the other side, a lot of opportunities are out there. So if you would suggest you know, to, to a new startup, or, uh, what could be the right moves to do in this specific moment? Uh, what would you recommend? Well, I actually think it is an interesting time. I think anytime there are disruptions, there are opportunities. And I think swimming against the stream, against the current, is actually a good thing to do. I think raising capital may be a challenge. But there are always challenges. You know, no matter when you start, there's a challenge. If you have a really great idea that responds to a customer need, this is the time to get started. I think for an existing business, so I'm in a bunch of existing businesses, and I've told everybody, uh, you know, the first job is to survive, you know, to conserve cash, to do all the things that, that I talked about before. But you should have a small team within your enterprise thinking about the opportunities that are going to break free. There are going to be some adjustments within the marketplace and you don't want to appear predatory. You don't want to be thinking about how do you take advantage of a, of a sad situation, but there will be opportunities. And you had, so existing enterprises should have a team working on the things that are opening up. So I, I think moments of dislocation, disruption are actually very good times to think entrepreneurially. I, I, while you were speaking, I thought, wow, you probably um, would be my ideal professor, you know. I didn't have uh, amazing teachers in my university, at least I can't remember that. But on the other side, uh, I don't think it's easy to teach to, you know, at Stanford or Harvard. You have so many smart kids, students, super phenomenal geniuses, you know. So how is teaching to, to this kind of audience that is very demanding and very, very smart. I mean, what's your approach? Well, it's great. I mean, I, I love my students. I, I really do. And what that means is I, I want what's best for them. 
and I really do care about them. I don't like all of them all the time, but I love all of them, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, but I, I recognize that uh, every person in that classroom is smarter than I am. But right. I've had 50 years of experience, you know, and, and so I, I've seen the movies many, many times, and I have a kind of a predictive ability, you know, that they say that wisdom is the ability to predict the future. And so there's kind of a wisdom that comes up from having seen these movies many, many times over. And I don't care how smart you are. You don't, you, if you haven't seen the movie, it's always a surprise ending. And so I can help guide them. I can be a bit of a river guide. I can challenge them. I can force them to role play situations there. They all say, well, if I were in that situation, I would. And then I say, okay, we're in that situation. Talk me out of it. And they don't know how to role play. They don't know how to actually hold the conversation that would get the job done. And that's kind of a revelation to a lot of them. So brains are one thing, but they're not everything. Got it. I, 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 let's stay on leadership, uh, uh, Joel, and then I have a couple of questions from the chat. What do you think is the right way to take really hard decisions in this moment? I mean, you have to fire people that you can't pay uh, mm -hmm. because you're restructuring or... Um, you have to decide, uh, okay, I reopen. I have uh, some friends working in the events, uh, event, event sector. And in Italy, if you organize an event, now I think you, you can organize an event with 200 people if it's a closed event or 1,000 people if it's an open space, okay? But you have a responsibility. So imagine that someone get COVID there, they can sue you uh, and it's uh, civil law and, and crime is a crime. So it's, it's very dangerous. Or, uh, you know, if someone come to work, you say, okay, you have to go back to the office. What, what happened if something happened? So it's a very difficult situation. What do you recommend to do to leaders that have to take these big, big problematic decisions in this moment? Yeah. Well, those are tough ones. Uh, there's always a cost benefit analysis. And you sort of say, what are the costs of doing it? What are the benefits of doing it? And what are the probabilities of something bad happening? And if that probability is too high, and if the cost is too high, you explain to people, say, you know, I would love to do this, but I can't do this. For the so you keep people, again, this term inside the tent. So people understand your decision making. In the end, I think analysis helps you make decisions. You are going to have to do some of them based on instinct. You cannot have all the information that you need. And that's where it helps to have a lot a track record of having made good judgment calls, having seen the movie. Uh, but these are t you're, the ones you mentioned are really tough. I, I actually think the government, if it w wants to get the economy going again, it's going to have to protect entrepreneurs. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are going to have to say, we've met these standards. We understand them the and they can certify that. But if they've met those standards, they cannot be. Th this is a virus for crying out loud. Nobody knows much about it. We're all learning together and to have legal liability for something that you cannot know about is folly. It, that's yeah. just a mistake. Luigi Mays from YouTube is asking, what's your opinion on how American entrepreneurs have faced this uh, tragic economic scenario? What, what's your um, general opinion about uh, how um, US entrepreneurs are reacting? Well, I'm not sure I can generalize. Uh, some have done well, some have not done well. You know, I try to make the distinction in this book about the pure entrepreneur who is typically somebody who lights fires, who innovates, who creates. And they're amazing people. They're, they're really phenomenal. You can put them in a garage and they'll create a new product. I mean, they're incredible. But that does not make them an entrepreneurial leader. Entrepreneurial leaders are what I call five-tool players. They, they actually can preside. They can innovate. They can uh, manage complexity, they can manage policy, and they can make deals and compromises. They can act as a politician. So having all those tools together is a fairly rare thing. And I think that kind of entrepreneurial leader is the kind that will thrive going forward. I think pure entrepreneurs, there'll be more variability. Some will hit on an idea and it will take off and they'll be fine. Others will be floundering, lighting fires, racing to and fro. They won't build teams. They won't communicate. They won't do all the things that you need to do to build an enduring enterprise. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. I'll throw uh, some random questions. Uh, Nicola from YouTube. Mr. Peterson, do you see how educated is my community? Mr. <laughs> Peterson, yeah. in well, your opinion, <laughs> not Joel, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, nice. uh, 
<laughs> how the new cold war between us and china will affect the entrepreneurs we saw a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fighting and uh, tension between us and china um what what is what's your perception from from a us point of view about this uh, chinese uh, situation well i think it's a dangerous situation i think both sides have a lot at stake uh and typically if that if there's wisdom that goes along with that and the realization that there's a lot at stake there are compromises made and things get done i, I would expect tensions could escalate here for a while until people realize that you hope it doesn't break into a hot war in certain places. I mean, I worry about Taiwan. I worry about the South China Sea. Um, you, you do worry about trade and tariffs, and, but I know the United States is going to bring back certain supply chains are going to be brought back. That will hurt China. China will retaliate. So I, I would expect some disruption. Henry Kissinger, as you know, has written an article that basically said the world order has been disrupted permanently. And uh, we don't know how yet how it's going to congeal, what's going to happen. I think the United States is in fairly good fundamental position in terms of ports, uh, rivers, ability to transfer goods and services across the country, its size, its population, the educational system. So I think there's a lot of fundamentals there, but that doesn't mean in the next few years it's not going to be really disrupted. Let, let's go back to uh, the airlines for a second. I see a lot of questions about airlines, of course, in the, the chat. Alessandro is asking if you believe that there will be another airline consolidation post-COVID in Europe and the US. What kind of scenario do you imagine in the next, uh, uh, in the next years uh, for, for the airline companies? I think that's a great question. And I think you have to consider that possibility. There has been a lot of consolidation already, certainly in the United States eight airlines became four. Those four uh, have about 85% of the market. So that's a lot of consolidation. That's a lot of concentration in small numbers. So uh, there could be a little bit more that goes on. Uh, there could be some bankruptcies. You know, this bridge is only through the end of September, at which time they're going to have to be furloughing. And, and if people aren't traveling again, I would see some disruption, which will turn into consolidation. Uh, I think what the government has wanted to do was protect salary. So m much of the money that the government has provided the airlines is really uh, instead of unemployment benefits. It's really been that. But at some point in time, those are going to run out. And if the industry hasn't picked up by then, I think it's going to come under pressure. When it's under pressure, you can see uh, that people will look at consolidation scenarios. I was, um, I wouldn't say surprised, but anyway, uh, the fact that uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett decided to to sell, I think, majority of their uh, airline companies' shares. I don't know. I, I I thought really because I mean they always thought long term and uh, do, do they really think that people will not travel again uh, in the next five years? I mean, I, I was really surprised. What was your reaction? Well, I think I was a little bit surprised too because they are really steady long term investors. The one thing that they've done really well is back management teams. You know, they've really been as good as anybody that I know at thinking about who are the great management teams. Uh, they did not invest in JetBlue. And I think we have, I mean, this will sound self-serving, but I think we have the best management team in the airline industry and really a good model and whatever. So uh, I think they were making a sector bet. I think they feel that the sector is going to be under pressure for a number of years and maybe some other things will happen that will pull them back in. But uh, you know, I, that was my reaction. Got it. Got it. And what about the the space travel? Is this something that in the industry is talk about? I, I see on Saturday, uh, Elon Musk with SpaceX and NASA, they will they will throw astronauts in the sky, in the, in, in the space. And uh, um, is space travel something that you are watching, considering, uh, or, or is still early days? I think it's very early days. I think it's a hobby for wealthy people who want to have an experience. So there could be that. But I, I think in terms of sort of mainstream things, you know, there was not a lot of uh, creativity in the whole airlines. I mean, the equipment, we were still flying planes that were designed in the 60s, um, you know, and then with composites and, you know, better fuel efficiency and some of these new engines and whatever, we're seeing some things. We've made an investment in electric planes. Uh, we think that'll happen. They're talking about uh, liquid natural gas being a fuel of the future. Well, that's 
that's going to take 20, 30 years to develop that. But I, I think there will be things. I think space travel is a little bit, it, it's a step even further out. Got it. Uh, a couple of more questions, uh, Joel. There are tons of questions. I hope you have the next three days to answer all the rest. <laughs> so another one is, um, oh, that, I like this because it's a curious uh, question from a uh, YouTube. Great interview. What is your daily routine as a college professor? I like it. You know, like uh, what is a college professor? Daily? I mean, you're not only a college professor, but let's say... Um, your your daily routine in this period uh, so, how does it work i almost have to say as a preamble that i'm one of the original members of the gig economy uh, gigs are are i'm sure that your audience knows are people who just have a bunch of different jobs yeah. so i have i founded several companies during this time i've served on dozens of boards i uh, i've been the the chairman of the hoover institution which is a think tank uh, and then I've taught these classes at Stanford. So I, I kind of bounce between things. So when I'm there on campus, uh, I'm preparing classes, I'm meeting with students, or I'm in the classroom. And I try to do this wall to wall as I can. So I teach four course, three courses, four sections when I'm on campus, So which is as much as most professors do in the entire year. I love wow. students, I love being with them. I love the teaching process. What I don't do is research. You know, a lot of the professors, they get tenure by doing research. They are real scholars. I'm, I'm a fraud. I, I come in with experience <laughs> uh, and with the love of students, and I try to, you know, uh, give them experience um, through my own eyes. And, um, and so... And through your, yeah, through your real, uh, real yeah. experience, I mean, yeah. uh, the, which is uh, very, very important. From LinkedIn, we have uh, Rosario asking, very interesting interview. I would like to ask how important could be for a firm in this period to operate in uh, competition with other players to redefine their offerings? Uh, uh, I probably you'd also talk, talk about this in your book, leadership and uh, collaboration, partnerships. Uh, what, what's your take on this? Well, I'm a big believer in collaboration and partnerships and cooperation. I'm also a big believer in open competition. I think it actually uh, is to the benefit of consumers for people to compete for their loyalty, to provide better and better products for each other. So I think this idea of central planning or cooperation doing that, it doesn't really do it as efficiently or as effectively. On the other hand, for example, in the airline industry, we don't compete on safety we don't compete on a whole bunch of things. We, we really collaborate. If we figure out something that is gonna make air travel safer, we share it with everybody in the industry as does everybody. So I think, I think you have to kind of define what areas are you gonna cooperate and what areas are you gonna compete. Great. So uh, Joel, if, if we chat again in one year, uh, what do you think, what, open your crystal ball and uh, give me a prediction of the 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 ecosystem the business ecosystem where we'll uh will will uh, work and uh and try to to compete so i actually think so by the way there are umpteen scenarios we've have, we've done all these tabletop exercises assuming there's a, a a v recovery a u recovery an l recovery l-shaped recovery Right. Uh, and I think there are arguments that you can make for any of those. And I think it's dangerous to get wedded to any single one of them. So I think you ought to look at all of those. My own personal view, however, is that people will learn to come back. There's not infinite amount of money uh, that a government can provide. Um, we can't print money. Uh, money doesn't come from the government. It comes from the hard work of of human beings. So there's only so much that can be done. And we've done, I think, a lot of what can be done. To me, what that means is the economies have to get started again. I actually think that uh, we base our initial policy responses were kind of a blunt instrument based on bad models. I think the model from Imperial College in London and from the University of Washington overstated the danger by, a fact, by a, an order of magnitude. I mean, the denominator was wrong, demonstrably wrong. Everybody knows that. I think we're getting figures in now that suggest that the numerator was probably off too, that many things that were 
counted as COVID deaths were actually people who died with COVID, not because of COVID. Yeah. Well, if you make those adjustments, and if people wear masks and use plexiglass and caution and everything, we're going to have to see the markets come back. So I would expect a market to come back, markets to come back. I think they'll, they won't roar back, uh, but people will adapt. People are smart. People figure things out. They want to be with other people. They want to see sporting events. They want to do all these things. So there's going to be a modified approach to getting that done. And my guess is the world will adjust and be back in business a year from now. Great. Joel, thank you so much for uh, for this chat. It was really a pleasure. Entrepreneurial leadership. Uh, I wish you big, big good luck with the, uh, with the book. I, uh, I, I think also the title is great. I mean, it's exactly what is uh, required and needed in this moment. So I, I hope it will be a great success. Thank you so much, Joel, and keep in touch. Thanks so much.